All right. Uh, yeah. So time. I'm gonna go ahead and get started here. Uh, let's see. Okay. So, um, we uh, so we're up to week four here. Um, we're actually, you know, uh, this week uh, is uh, chapter three from our hands on machine learning textbook to about classification stuff. Uh, although I have, um, so my plan is today, there's some stuff from previous week that I didn't really talk about, which I think would be a good idea to talk about. Uh, I, I'm going to talk a little bit more about scikit-learn um, that we had in there before I get into um, uh, talking about classification um, that we have this week. Um, oh, as, as a reminder, uh, our assignment two, we still got a little bit of time for assignment two. I haven't really released it yet, so don't start working on it yet. I am um, uh, going to make a few modifications to um, what I've currently got. So. Uh, I wanted to have that before today, but it's, it's not really ready. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you when, but but hopefully by our next class meeting, we can talk more about that and I can release it for people to begin working on. Although it will be similar. Um, basically, I'm going to be asking you to do some, you scikit learn to do some regression and some classification. So even though we haven't really talked about either of those. So our chapter three that we did last week was really a regression problem. So you get a flavor for it. And then this week, we're going to talk about classification. So. Um, there are, um, I'll just remind you, there are kind of videos, uh, a lot of these things. So I'll be covering a lot of overlap with a lot of this in class. Um, there is, uh, one video about, this would be the most important for, uh, the assignment two. Um, so I kind of have some examples of using stats model and the scikit-learn framework for doing, um, uh, regression and classification problems. Uh, stats model, especially there's no examples of stats model from our textbook. So this is kind of the only place where I had that. Uh, I just wanted to mention, um, I, I need to, I need to reorganize some of this stuff, but uh, that, that uh, notebook I'm just talking about is kind of hidden. You have to go to the archive, even though I've really kind of unarchived it, but um, 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 I hope to talk about some of that maybe uh, some sometime this week here, but the one with the example from the stats model is in the lectures archive subdirectory called the um, uh, using sklearn and using stats models in there. So that notebook is in there, um, but uh, but yeah, it's a little bit hidden. You have to find it. So. Uh, where most of the stuff we're using this week is um, you know, reminder is under the HOML, which stands for hands-on machine learning. So uh, I wanted to to talk a little bit more about some of the stuff from uh, chapter two. We didn't really talk about the training team, um, not too long. And but uh, and then you know we're, we're working on chapter three this week though, uh, classification um, uh, problems and examples. Right? So those are in there. Oh, and one other thing, as I mentioned this last week, uh, but um, there are some lecture notebooks and some videos like a review of calculus, review of probability statistics. You have time it's a good point to do those to, to do some review of those especially um, um uh, let's see here like next the week after next we're going to get into gradient descent so understanding the basics of um of um, uh, derivatives and um uh, how they work and some other stuff like that uh will be useful for understanding deeper when we when we get into gradient descent and optimization methods. So we're not going to be doing that heavy that stuff, so don't, don't get panicked or too worried about that. But you know, I mean, you, you can really enhance uh what you get out of this course uh, if, if you at least um, you know know the basic concepts from calculus. So, um and there's lots of good stuff out there if if this material doesn't work very well for you. But I, there's there's a pretty good review of calculus in that lecture notebook and that video. Uh, also, probability and statistics, you know, knowing the basics of that will certainly help a lot um, on this course here. So, um, all right, I think that's it for announcements. Um, so we will, yeah, we will carry on. Um, and you know, we'll get more into our second assignment. Still don't, don't have that quite ready to go yet, but um, so let me, um, 
let me just jump right back to this. So this was stuff that I supposedly had for the previous week. Um, and there are lecture videos kind of me going over this, but I want to talk a little bit about some of these things here. I don't think I want to rerun this notebook uh, because it does actually build our first examples of building some models uh, using scikit-learn uh, are in this. If you've gone through this uh, yet uh, already. Um, so um, I wanted to put, we spent probably maybe a little bit too much time, but we, we talked a little bit about train test split. Uh, we were talking about the stratified shuffle split last time, some things like that. Um, let me let me point this out here. This will be very useful uh, for our assignments, uh, maybe not the next assignment, but uh, uh, assignments after number two, understanding how to use the pipeline framework and second learn uh, will be very useful for doing your uh for, for doing training and some other things um well um uh well i think that back a little bit so so there, there's a good example in this from the textbook but uh i already mentioned that uh for most of this class we tend to give you the the data sets are pretty clean already so you don't have to do a lot of of uh, data cleaning and um and scaling your data and, and re-encoding you know categorical data things like that uh, but uh, this, this is one of the really good things about chapter two um, is it introduces the um, um, uh, using pipelines. Okay, so these are um, um, a concept that you'll find in a lot of places. This is just how they're implemented in Scikit-Learn. So basically, since everything is a, um, 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 so most of these objects are um, um, uh, transformers. So what that means is, is you know, you'll give it a set of inputs, they'll transform it some way, and the result will be the, the, the data with the same shape, but they're transformed, okay? So you can actually build pipelines, these steps, so this is especially useful for uh, data cleaning um, and um, transformations of, of different kinds, right? So you'll normally wanna do this if you have a complex set of steps, uh, figure out, the the you know and create a pipeline so that you can do this whenever needed. And so the example that we have in um, from chapter two is uh, we did a couple of things. Uh, so we had some missing data. So we used a uh, a transformer that would fill in missing data with the medians for that time. Right. So that's the first thing. Um, because we have to handle numerical data and string or categorical data differently. Uh, in this example, you know, we have two separate pipelines. One is really meant to uh, transform those categories uh, in using a one-hot encoding. And so that's the that's the, um, um, the the categorical pipeline. It must be up above here somewhere. So so here the the num pipeline I have on the view here. We're doing a couple of steps, right? So what happens here um, is. Um, uh, you know, we first uh, fill in missing values with an imputer. The results of that gets uh, sent to this combined attributes adder. Um, I don't think I'll go into the details of that, but you know, this is a, um, an example of using the scikit-learn API to add in your own transformer so that we can have it like a pipeline for this. Uh, this basically uh, creates those attributes, um, you know, it creates new columns in the data frame. Uh, with uh, bedrooms per room and could do some other things in this example, right? So, so yeah, actually, um, I, I might have misspoke a little bit. So the the shape of the data frame isn't necessarily the same. It's just that every next step in the uh, pipeline has to be able to correctly handle a data frame or a, a matrix of that shape, right? So, uh, you know, the, the simple imputer is just going to fill in missing values, so the, the 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 data frame will be the same shape. We just uh, filled in some NAs. But after we do this, if we call it, it might have added a few new features. Right? So we have a few extra columns um, after we go through the attributes, combine attributes out of it. And then scaling, um, um, I guess I didn't really talk about that. Um, um, so scaling can be important for some machine learning algorithms. So your data isn't necessarily going to have the same sort of range 
So in this data set, some data range from like zero to one, some data range from zero to 1,000. So it had very different kind of ranges. So uh, I should probably talk about this more some other time, but um, you know, uh, this was covered in chapter two, at least in the introduction to it. So um, for some machine learning methods, we need to rescale the data so, as, so every feature has a common range or, or a, a similar range. Like from zero to one, or, or all has a, a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Right? So the uh, anyway, the, the the standard scalar that we had actually transforms things into a standard um, deviation. So every column ends up having a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, I believe, if I remember right, in the standard scalar. So there's different things you can do with that. And like I said, we should probably come back to that at some point. Uh, when we talk about like um, support vector machines, some others that are sensitive to the uh, scale of your features. Um, so um, this is relatively new in scikit-learn within the next last year or two. Um, so you used to kind of had to do some kludgy things if, if I had to transform some columns differently than how I transformed others. Uh, so, but yeah, now uh, you can actually create pipelines that uh, use separate pipelines where, so the numerical pipeline is supposed to work on uh, the numerical attributes of the day frame and the, the, uh, the one hot encoder works on that categorical variable, the, the distance from the ocean to uh, put it into a one hot encoding, like we talked a little bit last time. So that one hot encoder, maybe that's in the, it's gotta be up here above here somewhere. Uh, oh, um, yeah, so I mean, actually, that's it right there. It actually creates it. Right? There's only one step on, on this one. This this pipeline was, was that it has three steps in it. So and, and in this example, we explicitly use the uh, pipeline object, right? So um, I don't know if I should say more about that. I mean, you know, no, the, 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 the format of this is really relatively simple. So we're actually using a tuple here. So it's kind of like a, a list. Remember a tuple is, is a list, but uh, it's it's an immutable list, right? So really all you need to do to specify a pipeline is this, the first item in each tuple is a name. And the second one is actually an object, which needs to be a transformer object of the right type. And then the, the order that you put those in will be the order that they are, um, um, they're actually executed. Um, so yeah, I mean, with that, then, you know, if I need to do this cleaning multiple times, I can do it with a single call once I set up the pipeline. And so basically, if we give it the raw housing data, the result uh, of, of sending it through the pipeline is all those things get done in our data transformation. So we impute, we add some attributes if we want to, we scale all of our features. Uh, we encode the categorical information using a one hot encoder. So that should be the result in housing prepared. So, you know, so, so now we've got 16 columns where before we only had like 10 or nine uh, because you know we added a couple of columns and the one hot encoding changed it from that string into five columns of zero or one. Um, all right, so yeah. There's more we could say about that, but uh, I did want to um, uh, talk a little bit about you know, the, the stuff in the last part of this, as well as get started on the classification material a bit. Um, so um, here, I mean, this is something that you'll be doing for the second assignment. So uh, our first example um, is we want to fit uh, a model. Um, so remember, this data is an example of a regression problem. So we're trying to fit a model that will predict house, house price, uh, really the, the, the average or the median house price uh, in a district, given information about uh, you know the population of that district and um, uh, all the other features that we have in our data set. Right? Um, right, and it's a regression problem in this case because I mean essentially any price from 
$10,000 to millions, although our data is capped at like 500,000, remember, um, so, um, but um, any price, any real value number could be the price that we're trying for damage. So that's your regret. Classification problem, like we'll talk about today, if you haven't gotten the reading yet, the thing you're trying to predict is going to be a discrete set of values. Like the easiest is a binary classification where the label is either yes or no, one or zero. Right? So, so this is fundamentally different. So we're trying to predict like a real value number that could have potentially an infinite number of decimal digits, although for house price it doesn't really make sense to have more than two cents, right? But but it's essentially a regression problem. But um, you know, that's long-winded way of saying. Uh, so the, the pattern, you know, once your data is prepared and everything, to build a model in scikit-learn always looks like this. It's relatively simple. We create an instance of some model from scikit-learn. So we imported a linear regression object. So this performs uh, simple linear regressions. It expects, the, 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 expects two things. So, so when you fit the model, um, um, you have to give the, the input uh, as the first parameter. So that's our our data frame with the 16 columns now and, and all the rows. But we're using like all the data here. We're, we're later on, we'll be doing some train test splits down here in a moment. Uh, and then we've got the labels out in a separate data frame. It's actually a separate, um, um, probably a, a separate series or a, just a regular uh, NumPy um, array. Uh, uh, one dimensional vector here. So this will have all of our labels, but again, the labels are prices in dollars and cents. So now, once you fit the data, uh, oh, um, um, I'll probably ask you to do something like this in uh, assignment two, uh, although this probably doesn't mean anything to you yet until we talk about how li linear regression works in detail, but when you fit the model, it actually, these are actually the parameters and the coefficients of our fitted model, the, the best linear regression model for the data. So these will mean something to you later on if, if, if you don't know what linear regression does um, in this case here. Uh, but yeah, once we have our, our model, um, so uh, the, the thing that's returned from creating an instance, um, it, this is an instance of our linear regression object. So we can do fit, but we can then, once we fit the model, we can do a bunch of stuff with it. So, you know, so not only get the parameters that were fitted, right? So th this is some things that we talked about. Um, so one of the things for the scikit-learn framework is that everything is discoverable, right? So after we fit the model, you can use regular, uh, so we're accessing member variables of the object um, to, to access the coefficients of our thing. So normally, uh, you know, things that you want to discover that are member variables have an underscore at the end um, in scikit-learn uh, for these discoverable parameters, the coefficient and the intercept parameters here. Um, but we can do, you know, much more uh, important things are obvious things. So, for example, if I want to predict, uh, you know, if I want to use my model to predict what would the house prices be in the first five uh, days. So, we're, you know, here we're doing something that you really shouldn't normally do in this class. So, we're using the data we trained with in order to uh, make some predictions with and, and evaluate how it's doing. Right? So we just pull off the first five rows, um, the first five um, samples from our housing data set, uh, and also the, the first five labels as well. Um, and um, um, notice that, um, uh, oh, we retransformed this um, because we're pulling it from the raw again, even though I think when I did it before we, um, yeah, so, I mean, we're just doing it again, but here, uh, so we still are using the same data that we fit with, train with. So I'll, I'll use fit or training kind of interchangeably. It means the same thing in this context. So if, if we train with some data, we're fitting a model to our data here. Um, so we just pulled out uh, data that we already trained it with. So we're just taking five samples from the same data set. But since we got it from the raw data set, we, we use the pipeline to transform it again. Uh, but then we do things like ask it to make predictions, right? So now that the model is fitted, uh, we can say, okay, what would you predict as the house price for each of those five samples? So you get five 
numbers, which are meant to represent the, the house price that we would predict for the price uh, in those five um, districts that we pull up. Um, and, but you no, know, so, so here, what we're trying to do is begin to think about, okay, how do we evaluate how well the model is doing, right? So if we can compare what our predictions were to what the actual median house price was in those five districts. And, you know, I, I don't, it's, it's hard to evaluate how well this is doing. I mean, obviously, they've been, some of these look pretty bad. Um, like what the, uh, I mean, you know, in general, things that are small are small. Um, so um, um, let's see, what's the smallest one? I mean, our very first one is the, is the smallest, $72,000 there. And, and, you know, it's off by 13000 but at least... That was also the smallest of our predictions, predicting down the top. Um, so, I mean, it looks like there's some relationship. Uh, I guess another thing you can, I mean, you know, uh, it, are we always over predicting? So we were, we, we predicted too high for the first one, but the second one we under predicted a little bit. It was 300,000. Oh no, we, we over predicted again. So, so a little bit too high on that one. Um, so we're also, we seem to be over predicting. I guess we did it for all of these, right? Although sometimes we're closer than others, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. So, I mean, uh, it could be possible. It looked like we, we were a little bit too high for all these five, but it could be over, it could be under in some cases, uh, the way this model works. Um, so um, this is uh, an important, concept, we have to have to formalize um, how, you know, so we want to evaluate how well our model is performing, all right? So we have to formalize that somewhere. We can't just kind of eyeball the result and say, oh, it looks good, uh, doesn't, I mean, you know. Uh, so for a regression problem, um, um, we'll constantly be using, this, this is the measure we'll mostly use, the root, root mean squared error, all right? So, um, um, the idea is this. I don't know if I've got a good figure of this. Um, um, let's just take these here. So um, the idea is that if I have uh, these data um, and um, um, my prediction, since this is a linear model, you look at all the values that were predicted, it was a little bit too high there. Uh, they're going to actually end up being on a line. Okay, so my predictions uh, for these five are going to go from, uh, they'll all end up being on the same line. Um, you can visualize this in some space or hyper um, So 85,000. My predictions. Uh, so for that prediction, the actual value was like seventy-two thousand. Right, I'm just drawing that. So that was like sample, uh, sample one. Thousand. Uh, the next one we predicted. There are five thousand, two. That's all. So the idea of of root and square uh, is. Um, if I was always making perfect predictions, um, that would mean that these values in my predictions were always right there. Right? So the, the intuitively, what we're what we want to do is we want to measure how far away our prediction was from the actual label that we're trying to predict in the supervised model. So if we, if we get anyone that we get correct, we have an error of zero. Anyone that is off, we can measure the error uh, by taking the difference. Right? And again, I said this the first five here don't show it very well, but sometimes you can be 
today, sometimes it gets even smaller. And what we mean by error um, is what we're going to use for root and square error is just the difference. You know, so how different. So now that's like so like for this first one, uh, we were uh, 13. So if I take prediction minus that, we get uh, plus 13 minus. Um, and you know, for the second one, we get plus uh, 21,000. We had something like this, so let's, let's just say that this is um, we predicted um, 100. There's actually 150. Take the, the difference of those, you get the negative 50. Sometimes they can be under prediction, sometimes they can be over predicting. So, to formalize this, the, the first obvious thing to do is, is you, know, you don't want to, it's not a big deal how well it is on one particular one. You want to know overall. Uh, so, for all of my model, how close are my, my predictions getting to the, um, um, the actual plate? Uh, so, you just sum those up. And that's the first item. What if I just sum up all the errors? So these are errors. That's the error in root and square error. Um, I can sum those up. So the problem with just doing a simple sum is some things are going to be over predicted, some things will be under predicted. They might cancel themselves out. Right? So, it had a lots of really big errors, uh, but the, the ones that are over and the ones that are under are about the same. So I end up with the overall uh, sum of the model that's close to zero error. There's no really bad. Right. So the next obvious idea is I could do the, um, uh, the absolute square. So what R means root, and A means absolute. I just think the absolute value is a generic right? So, those are all plus, but that one would also be the plus thing. So that is the right thing that you want to do because if I sum these up, I, I want to know how, I want to add in how far away I was, whether I'm under or over. Right. Um, for various reasons, though, uh, which we will talk about later, um, for mathematical reasons, the absolute value is not as nice to use. And Squaring the value. Right? So, uh, another thing is just square these values. So, square value, even if it's negative, which is positive. Right? And there's an advantage to squaring it as well. So, uh, if I want to calculate the mean squared, uh, if I want to calculate the square error, I would square, I'd calculate the error, square them all, and sum them up. That would be the, the sum of the square error. Um, and um, then you know we're basically there. So the root mean squared error, uh, or was that? Um, uh, the mean squared error then is the, the sum of the squared errors, and then you let you divide by the average of those. Um, so if I sum them up, that's one big number is the sum of the squares of all my errors. So I want to kind of know the average of those uh, error, the squared errors. I'm just going to take that and divide by five by the squares. Uh, my five by the numbers for making that. But again, if I, if I take the average of the squared errors, the, the result is still something that's like a square. So if I want to convert that back, to basically about the same units as I wish I had. I take the square root of that. Uh, that will tell me on average how much my errors were in magnitude. Right? So that's what the root means here. I, I take the sum of the square errors, average them, and so take the mean, and then I take the square root. To get the root and, square root. and that gives me one number where it'll be zero if every prediction was exactly the same uh, uh, the true value that can hit will be zero if you do the sum of the square root. Uh, but the more things have bigger errors, the further the predictions are, the bigger that number will be. Right? So if we turn this into an optimization problem, 
Um, I want the trivial model to get that root to square root of zero. And the, the higher that is, the worse the model is performing by this you know, explicit measure that we're trying to offer. Right? Um, so, you know, um, uh, there's a function for the mean squared error. And I guess there's not one in, in scikit-learn for the root mean squared error, but you just take the square root. Uh, but um, um, yeah, I kind of I could run these. I didn't really want to run this notebook by hand, but um, um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm going to avoid the temptation to run some stuff here because some some of the models take a little bit of time to do. But um, you know, you could do that by hand. You know, so that that function is real simple. So if I took these, if I took my two arrays here called um, um, uh, the well, if I, if I took the things from the predictions and the labels, if I took the difference of those, squared them, and summed them up, uh, that would be the sum squared error. If I took the square root of that, you should get exactly the same result. I encourage you to, to confirm that with yourself uh, on this notebook here. So, and that's all it's doing is, is taking the difference of these, each one of these in a vectorized way, squaring those differences, then summing them up to one number, um, and that's your, uh, oh, and dividing by the, the by the number of values. So we have five values in this case. So we have to divide to get the mean, um, and then you take the square root to get the root mean squared error. Um, okay, we'll come back to the root mean squared error, but but um, um, and, uh, this is the measure that we're using for regression problems. This is an objective measure. Of, if I have a model, so I, I just fit a linear regression model, I can measure uh, using the root square error how well its predictions are doing with the set of data that I want to uh, predict it, you know, have it make predictions on. And that I can use that to compare models, right? The one that's giving a smaller root mean squared error is probably doing better with some caveats here that we should talk about. So um So actually linear regression models are relatively simple. Um, they're, they're not easy to say with art and machine learning in terms of building the model to give you the best prediction on data. So there's much more powerful ones, decision trees, um, uh, forests, we're going to talk about support back machines, neural networks and deep learning, uh, which we won't really get into in this course, but those are some of the state of the art. Um, so decision tree regressor, um, uh, is a type of machine learning model that we'll look at in this course. Uh, it usually will be a better performer, right? but the pattern is going to be the same. So if I wanted to create a model using a decision tree, um, I can do that. Oh, and by the way, there's usually slightly different versions for classification versus progression. So in scikit-learn, it's going to be name regressor for the, if you want to do, if you're doing a regression problem, it'll be name classification if, if you're uh, one of them. Fit a model to some, uh, you know, categorical data uh, to classify it. Um, so once we create the decision tree regressor, you know, um, we just fit it. We're fitting it to the same data. Uh, so notice here, th this is the the point of this uh, from the chapter in our textbook is um, we're trying to, to illustrate the idea of overfit and the, the chapter actually chase. So in this case, you know, um, if you're following along here, this should have been really surprising, or you know, maybe not surprising. So if you've never done this before, you might say, "Wow, this model is perfect. I can't do any better than that because there's no error. This is saying that the the the, the data uh, on the model that I just fit when I uh, calculate the root, the root mean squared error." Um, uh, is giving me perfect predictions for all the data. I didn't just use five this time, I used the whole data set. Um, the problem with this is uh, we're gonna get more into this, although for your second assignments, I don't think I asked you to do much of this, but the problem is, is that when you set a model that's high power, it's very easy to find a set of parameters on the model that will give you perfect, you know, that make perfect predictions on the data you train it. The real question, and, and that's what we did here, is we evaluated it. We, we um, um, 
we we fit it right here. Um, uh, the decision tree, we fit it on uh, all the data, but then we calculated our error term, uh, again, on the same data that we fit the training model. So, so we go right uh, in there um, and um, we're calculating our root mean squared error term on the same set of data. Right? And if the model has overfit the data, you'll get a really low score or zero like we did here. But that doesn't mean it's necessarily going to do well because uh, even, even though it perfectly fits the data you trained it with, data it hasn't seen before, um, it could very well be doing poorly on making predictions or data that wasn't in the training set. So it's it's overlearned, it's overfit. Um, um, it, it's learned specifically how to predict all of the 16,000 data that we trained it with, but stuff it hadn't seen, it could be very far off. And you'll learn more about why or how that worked. But that's really why uh, we need um, to split our data into training sets and testing sets. And there's various ways to do that. So another way is introduced here at the end of chapter three. Um, um, so we might want to split our data into uh, a set we're going to train with and then keep some back for a final test. But often, uh, while we're trying to build models, we, we want to build several different models and maybe compare them. So often, then the training set is further split into what's called a training and a validation set, right? which is kind of what we're doing here for this cross validation. So we take our da training data, uh, and maybe so the simplest method is take the training data and split it again into uh, training and validation. We can, if we're building separate models, we compare them on the held back validation set. And then once we pick a final model, we, we give an overall final evaluation on the, the held back uh, test set. Yeah. Right. Um, um, a cabled uh, cross validation um, is um, um, a variation of that idea. So uh, just real quick, I don't want to go into all the details of this. We'll, we'll be using capable cross-validation quite a bit. Um, so the basic idea is that if I have a training set, let's um, um, we'll say, you know, in our case, uh, I guess we didn't split it. So we've got like all 16,000 in there. This is how plus uh, samples, 16,000 rows in our data set. Uh, but we could uh, train multiple models splitting it different ways, right? So that way we train it on part of the data and then we, we test it on the data that we held back, it's known as the, the validation or the fold, right? So, so K-fold gets its name because, um, so in this case, we're doing a, a tenfold cross validation. That means we're gonna divide this up into 10 pieces. Uh, so the fold one will add, uh, 1600, first 1600, however, we can do great. Fold two, we have the next 1600. And so on, right? So we'll have 10 folds, all with, uh, roughly equal. Would, uh, again, I'm, I'm passing over some things here. It might not be a good idea to just break it up. We might need to shuffle it, do some other stuff, which I think by default, uh, the, uh, the cross validation uh, will actually randomly shuffle. Break it up in the number of folds that you say for cross validation. Uh, but then what we do is we're going to build 10 models. So we build one model where we hold back fold one to be our validation set. And we use the other nine folds. So, so we fit it with the other nine folds and then get a root mean squared error on that validation set that we didn't use in the training, right? So with the 10 fold cross validation, we do that 10 times where we hold out the fold. Uh, one of those, one of the different folds uh, for each of the ten models that we train, train on the other one and then validate it, and then held back fold at the end. This gives a better idea of how well the model is going to perform um, on unseen data, and to do this kind of uh, cross validation. Right? So. Um, So if you do it again, this this may not be obvious if you just look at this code, but it's really doing a lot of powerful stuff here. All right. So we're using the it's a function in scikit-learn 
uh, we're passing, notice what we're passing here. So we're passing in the tree regress object. So we, we, we're using the same object that we created um, for the decision tree. We're just passing it. So it's going to reuse that. It's going to re refit that model multiple times. But, but basically, we're returning, we're uh, training uh, decision trees uh, models here. Um, we're passing the, 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 the data and the regression labels as the next two parameters. Um, we're using the, the mean squared error. Um, we're using data of that, which the textbook discusses that, but we're really using the root mean squared error still here. Um, So um, uh, the the main thing that's returned back from that is the the uh, the scores object here. Actually, that's just the list of the uh, the that's the root mean squared error that we got on the ten model. So uh, since it's actually the negative, uh, if we take the and, and we're actually it's returning back the uh, the mean squared error, uh, the negative of it. So if we take this. Uh, we negate it, take the square root, we're back to the root, root mean squared error. But there should be 10 of those in there. So that's what these are. All right. So, um, you know, if you didn't follow this, what happened here is we, we showed that um, this model isn't really doing as well as you might have thought when you calculated its performance on the whole data set it was trained with, right? So this is a better idea of how it's going to do on unseen data. So for the 10 miles that we built, um, uh, we still have our average root mean squared error was about 70,000, um, which um, I don't remember. I think we showed that for the linear regression. It's actually a little bit worse than the linear regression, which was close to 68,000. That was the root mean squared error, right? I forgot to mention it there. I mean, you know, that that really doesn't sound very well because house prices go from like 50,000 to 500,000. So that means on average, there are errors off by almost $70,000, uh, a little bit under when we ran it on the linear regression. And um, this is evidence that uh, on, you know, that, that the model, this in this case, the model is badly overfitting for the decision tree. But so we're still, if, if you evaluate it on data it wasn't trained with, we're getting still 70,000, actually a little bit worse than that. So really not as in, not that impressive, not really doing well. Um, although these, uh, the, this is discussed in the textbook, these are doing poorly for different reasons. The linear regression is probably badly underfitting the data, where the um, decision tree uh, is probably badly overfitting the data. But in both cases, the performance is probably better. Hopefully, we do much better on this. Um, so, um, yeah, I guess for completeness, textbook also shows cross validation again, but on linear regression. So uh, you'll notice that the performance stays about the same. Uh, so this is this is one way that you can maybe um, um, begin to think that you're underfitting. So uh, if you're doing poorly, but you do the same amount of poorly both on the data you train with and also on held back test data or held back validation data, you're probably underfitting if it's the same level of back performance both. Um, so yeah, no, so it's about the same, maybe a little bit, or 68,000 before, 69,000 here, if you average up all the performances on the 10 folds. Um, so besides decision trees, um, we'll talk a little bit about the ensemble methods. And of course, they're really just a collection of lots of decision trees where you combine their results into a single result. Um, so random forests usually can uh, perform better, sometimes much better than a single decision tree. But we have to fight the overfitting. So um, I think I discussed a little bit here. 
Yeah, I don't remember. But, um, but you know, notice, I mean, I still wouldn't call this really great performance, but it definitely improved. Um, so we went from like around 70,000 to 50,000 for the end. So there's some hope there. Uh, and, and that, again, that's on the validation of like, some of the data that was not trained, probably not trained at all. So that's a better indication of how this might be doing on you know, making predictions on the unseen data. Um, um, but because that improved, you know, 20, 20,000 better, which is like, you know, 30, 40% improvement, um, there's some hope that, you know, if we if we further fought over, it might still be overfitting. So if we did some methods that fight overfitting, we can maybe even get that better. Know, less than 50,000. Um, all right, how are we doing? Um, that's mostly it. Um, I'll point this out. Um, I think you know, for assignment three, you might find it useful to do a screen search as an example of this. Uh, yeah, I, I think this is mostly in chapter two to show off some of the power of things you can do with scikit learn framework. So a common thing that I want to do is, yeah, if, if I want to fine tune a model, um, so we're sticking with the, uh, the, the random forest uh, regressor here, but uh, we're going to try and uh, tune what are known as some of the meta, meta parameters. Right? So we've got to know what these are yet, uh, but these are different things about um, how the random forest should be created. Number of estimators, maximum features, um, and some other stuff, right? Um, so I want to actually do a grid search, uh, but uh, um, and we're using fivefold instead of ten because this is the one that I take quite a bit of time. Um, if you ran this, I don't think that was time, but like ten minutes or five minutes or something. Um, but I'm going to do five fold, five fold cross validation, but I want to do it on a model. Um, that uses a random forest with three estimators and two features, with three estimators and four features, three estimators. So every combination of these two parameters, we're going to create a random forest. So there's actually three. There's actually twelve random forests, but also this as well. So there's there's three here. One times two times three. So there's twelve potential combinations there, and then there's um, um, six. And you know, so there's Actually, 18 random forests that we're going to build with all possible combinations of uh, the, the two parameters for the first and the, and the three parameters for the second. Um, each of those 18 models, we want to do five fold cross validation, like we just talked about, and then compare them. Um, yeah, so grid search is more complicated than the simple cross validation. Um, so we're combining searching over the meta parameters in this grid uh, with cross validation. So it's actually an object uh, that we return. So notice that uh, we pass in the uh, classifier that we want to use, but we pass in this is really just an array of these grids. It's really, an, these are dictionaries. It's not obvious. So this is the, the name of the parameter and the different values. So when it, when it creates or when it re makes a new forest regressor, um, it will look this up. It'll use that as the parameter name. It will use that as like the value for the parameter when it creates the next random forest regressor. Um, and we talk more about that. That's kind of what's happening. Um, so yeah, the, the result is much more complex. Uh, so we've actually got 18 models, all 18 models. We're we'll do five full cross validation here. Um, so, the result of that, though, you can uh, get less powerful stuff. So there's, there's lots of discoverable um, print, you know, member variables. So uh, the, you're usually the, the, the main question you want to know is, okay, which of those combinations I just grid search does the best, right? So if I ask for the best parameters, I get that. So this must have come from um, the first model. Um, so it says that of these that I selected, three estimators with um, I'm um, oh, sorry, uh, uh, six features with 30 estimators ended up being the best of the 18 different random forests that I was talking about. Um, 
So yeah, six wasn't the max here, but you know, it's always, if you do a grid search and the best parameter ends up being at one end or the other, maybe maybe we should have tried, you know, 40 or 50, maybe, maybe we'll continue decreasing if, if that parameter number best meters gets bigger. Maybe, maybe not. Um, but um, yeah, you can get the actual object. So this is the actual fitted, trained, uh, random forest with those parameters on it. Um, and um, um, these were all these were the root mean square errors, right? So if you count that up, there should be eighteen there. Like that, there was eighteen random forests that we created, and that was the uh, cross validation. So that was the average over the five bottles for each of those eighteen. So it ranges from. Uh, I see a high of about 64,000 to our best one was the uh, six features 30, uh, just breaks 50,000. Um, didn't do too much better than the single random forest that we did with the default parameters, but maybe, you know, maybe if we keep searching this, we can get that further down below 50,000. All right. Um, yeah, I'm going to move on. I mean, there's a few other things there, but that's um, some of the more interesting stuff on this one. Uh, yep. Yeah. So we got a little bit of time left. So let's let's at least get started then on classification. That's the stuff that we're supposed to be doing for this week here. Um, this is all from chapter three, but it's broken up into two um, separate notebooks. So uh, we can first talk about binary classification, then we can uh, generalize that. So, um, um, oh, yeah, I'd forgotten about this. Um, um, so the, the, the MNIST data set, um, let me just say one or two things about that. Um, so we'll be using this a lot. Uh, some people call this like the, uh, the, the fruit fly, the machine learning, fruit fry data set of machine learning. So it's, it's used a lot for testing things and demonstrating stuff, right? Um, hopefully in here, if not in the textbook, there's some examples. So really the MNIST data is, uh, it's, uh, we, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't call it a big data set nowadays, but uh, there's like 70,000 images, I guess, in here. The number of features is 784 because each image is uh, a 28 by 28. E each one of the samples is a, like a 28 rows by 28 columns. Um, and, and these were originally hand-drawn digits. So uh, uh, the, the task on the MNIST, the full data set is, um, if I have these hand-drawn digits, I can do a class. This is a classification task. task. So if I want to predict those, so I, I was given the image, like the upper left one, and I want to predict that it's a, actually five digits. Uh, this is a classification task because uh, there's only there's only 10 possibilities, right? So I've got a discrete number of categories uh, that I want to predict. This is a multi-class classification that I'm talking about here because the, the, the label can be 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 9. 10 possibilities. Um, so yeah, for the full task, you know, I'm going to train, I'm going to give it my 28 by 28, which is the, um, um, the, the 784, I can't multiply 28 by 28 in my head. So I've actually got 784 pixel values. The, the pixel values range from like zero to one. So it's really just grayscale. Um, um, so zero for white and one for black or something like that. So, um, but given that, then can I build a classifier that will output the actual digit? From the, that's the, the basic MNIST. Um, yeah, I'd kind of forgotten about this. Um, um, uh, we were having problems with it before. So this notebook, this notebook, the way I have it right now, won't work unless you download by hand um, a version of the, the MNIST 784 is for this version of the data set with 784 feature. Pixels for each image. Um, um, uh, 
Uh, although, you know, it's much better than instead of trying to manage it by hand to just use uh, the, um, so there's some built-in things from scikit-learn to fetch different data sets that you might want to use. I just check if this is working yet or not for my most recent version of the stuff. So um, uh, the, you know, in scikit-learn, there's sets of data sets that people use for demonstrations and uh, testing things in the data sets subdirectory. Um, so you can get the uh, you can get different open machine learning data sets with the fetch open ML open ML uh, method, of which MNIST is one of several open source machine learning data sets. Um, so the result of that should be. Um, um, you actually end up with a, a dictionary uh, with different things. So in particular, you know, if you just want to do simple stuff, um, this works. You can just uh, pull out the data from that dictionary you get, use that for your uh, inputs. So we often use big X, capital X, as a, a regular matrix as the inputs uh, when we're doing classification. Generically, X is going to be our inputs. Um, and uh, Y, we lowercase Y, since it's a vector, uh, we use that usually for the labels, whether it's a classification or regression task. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's working now. So, so you know, if you want to, you can um, do it from the official source instead of kind of trying to do it by hand. Let's see if that's true, though. So. So yeah, if you do that, um, you know, you'll get basically, um, so here in X, we've got 70,000 images of 70,000 samples, which is the number of rows, and 784 features, which is one for each of the pixels, you know, 20 by 20, although it's flattened. So it's not a three-dimensional array, it's two-dimensional. We've flattened all, all the, uh, the rows of the images into one single dimension in our array here. Um, yeah, it's really just NumPy arrays. So, Although, you know, so some data sets, you know, using pandas is, is really helpful, but here every feature is just a pixel image value. So not the like use that a pandas data frame would give you for manipulating stuff here. So, um, yeah, it looks like that. Open ML fetch is working again. Um, um, and um, yeah, for this this notebook, uh, if you look through it, uh, we um, are going to break it up into a training and test set for some of the stuff that we do. Uh, so we'll hold back ten thousand uh, for testing and keep sixty thousand for training. Again, we might. Do validate so we might you further divide that sixty thousand training into some training validation sets stuff like that. Uh, but okay, so back to we're, we we really want to start off with binary classification, okay? Because doing a classification task with more than two classes is a general case. Uh, so the most basic thing that you can do is a binary classification. It's already mentioned. Um, so like uh, if you want to build a uh, an email spam filter. You might have a database of email as input, um, and your label would be it's either spam or it's not spam. So it's a binary classification. Right? Um, we can uh, uh, make a uh, a five so a five image detector. So we can turn this into a binary classification. So here we create a different set of labels, which are going to be binary labels. So here everything where the label is five will be true or one in the Y train five and everything that's not a five will be false. Right? Since we've got about an equal number of, uh, of, of samples, um, this binary uh, task that we're going to do here is going to be a little bit unbalanced, which would be a problem for binary for any classification task, because we've only got uh, maybe like 10% of the labels with five and 90% will be non-five. Right? Sometimes they have problems when you Try to do a classification task where you have a, a lot more examples of one of the classes than of others. Right. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, so in this case, because of what we did, we've actually got an array of booleans. Uh, the first uh, 10 labels are uh, the, the first item in the data set was a five, and everything else wasn't a five. Um, which, you know, this should correspond to like this here. So yeah, the first one was a five and then the, the next nine were not fives um, in the data set as we load it from MNIST. Um, so this was uh, showing what I just talked about. So if you look at, this is actually counting up the number of fives that we have. So of the 60,000, only 5,421 are actually five, which blew on 10%, which is, is not exactly 10% of each one. So um, so in our training set, 9% of the total is the fives, if we're going to build a five classifier, binary classifier here. Um, but um, like we were just talking about, um, and uh, I don't know if it was a bad idea for me to rerun these, but um, uh, we can build a classifier on our you know, five, not five classifier. Uh, same pattern, like we just looked for for regression problems. So notice uh, we're gonna use a classifier called a SGD, which is a stochastic gradient descent classifier. We'll talk a little bit about what that is, um, but um, you know, uh, we build and we create an instance of the classifier that we want to train. Uh, we actually passed in some, so these are some meta parameters. We changed some of the default meta parameters. Um, so I won't talk about those right now. But um, so, so we create an instance of a classifier, this SGG classifier, and then we fit it to our data, right? So our input is the just the training data, uh, you know, so 60,000 rows. Um, with the uh, 28 by 28 columns um, as inputs. Um, and our labels are five, not five. True, true to five or false, it's not a five. And we can see how we did. Um, so, um, so, yeah, so here, what we're, one thing we're leading up to is the, the performance measure, the root, root mean squared error that I just talked about for regression doesn't make it's not as we can't directly use that as a performance measure for a classification class. We could kind of because if we predict like a zero, but for binary, you can think of it as output either zero or one. So if we predict a zero and it's a one, we have an error of one. If the one is a zero, we have an error of one. So, so it, it, it would always be either an error of one or we get it correct with an error of zero. But that doesn't work very well if you do the like the the the, the sum of the errors of those. Um, so, um, um, anyway, with our train classifier, you know, we can do the same thing, some of the same things we talked about before. So we can uh, do some predictions on uh, what we do here. Um, we do a prediction on a single. So the the very the the digit at index zero was a five. Um, if we scroll back up there, so we actually just pull out a single digit, ask it to predict what that is. Um, 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 so in this case, it's a binary classifier. The the output when we do a prediction be either true or false. So that's what we train it with. True it was a five or false it wasn't a five. Right. So you know for the first one, um, um, we um, um, the label was a true, um, and we got it correct. We we're predicting true. Right. Uh, for the digit index one, the label was, was not a five, so the label is false. So we got that one correct as well. But how well are we doing overall? We, we, we were correct on our first two predictions. Um, so all the stuff that we talked about, um, I, I guess, um, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna defer talking about what how we're gonna actually measure. Uh, you know, how we're going to formalize whether we're doing, how well we're doing on the classification. We have to do something a little bit, uh, a little bit different than what we just did on the regression task, the root mean square error when we're doing classification. 
Uh, we'll, later on, we'll talk about why and, and what we do. But you know, everything we did for the regression, we can do the same thing. So if we want to see how well we're doing, like using cross validation, we can run a fivefold cross validation. Um, so, um, oh no, I, I guess yeah, we, I didn't we didn't specify the number of so CV was the parameters specified the number of folds. I guess by default it uses three. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, it's there. So we just run a three because it's a relatively big data set. So we, we go to ten folds. We have to train ten models. It take three times longer, four times longer. Um, so um, notice we're just using simple accuracy, right? So accuracy is another thing you can think of of how you might evaluate like classifier. So accuracy is just was my prediction correct or not, right? So all we're saying here is that on our three cross validation. Uh, models that we built, I got 95% accurate, 95% of the time I'm correct, 96% of the time, 96% of the three cross validation folds. Um, that's, that's not bad, right? 90 some percent. Um, but, um, um, you know, you always have to be aware of kind of the context of the results that you're getting. Um, so here, um, I build a classifier that doesn't really do anything. Or that, I mean, we're, we're actually, we're actually passing this in as this, as if it's a transformer from scikit-learn. Uh, so this is how you build a fit, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, the, the transformer. As long as you just implement those two methods, you can use it anywhere. You can use a, a transformer like the like, you know, classifiers and the regressors that we've been using so far. All we're doing for uh, predict those, just um, uh, no matter what data, how many items you ask us to make predictions for, I just always return zero or false. Uh, this always predicts it's not a five. Right? So if you look at that, you know we get uh, ninety percent. Accuracy, eh, not quite as good as before, right? But uh, it's doing absolutely nothing. It's always predicting, um, but it's not fine. And this is this is uh, I'm sure that this is discussed in the chapter. This is one of the reasons why unbalanced data sets for classification can be problematic. It's really unbalanced. You really have to be comparing your performance to always predicting the biggest class. So since over since uh, ninety one percent of the Items are not five. If I always predict not five, to get ninety-one percent accurate on my classifier, right? So you know, I don't. Know. I mean, it, it's uh, the, the the SGD classifier is doing a little bit of something, so it's, it's um, probably um, not totally hopeless. Uh, but uh, you know, it's not. You it shouldn't have been uh, like. Saying is doing really great, you know, because it's only doing a little bit, a few percentage above a, a base. This is this is an example of a baseline uh, for our model here. Right? So if you can't do better than ninety percent, you're not really doing anything because that's um, easy to get. So, um, let's see here. So uh, there's a little bit more on this first part here. Um, uh, let me just talk a little bit about confusion matrix, and then we can um, um, call it a day for today. So, um, another one of the first steps that you normally want to do when you're doing that classification task is, is maybe look at the confusion matrix. That will give you some information about how performance is doing. Um, so, in this case. Uh, Um, since this is a binary task, uh, uh, and, um, we're, we're classifying five or not five. Uh, basically, uh, um, for all the things we asked it to predict, uh, well, we did a cross validation again, but um, um, in the confusion matrix, the, these represent the, the correct ones on the diagonal. 
So this is, I might get this reversed here. I should look back here, but like the first row is where it was zero, so where it's false. And when we predicted correctly, it was false. So we did that 53,089 times. It was not a five, we predicted it was not a five. With, we were using the SGD classifier again here, I believe. Yeah, so we're just reusing the SGD. Um, and and down here is, you know, uh, we predicted it was was a five and we were right uh, 35, 30 of the time. So one thing you can see from this is that, you know, we're not all, you know, so we're not doing the baseline. We're not always predicting uh, that it's not a five, in which case you have to see nothing like over here and everything in one of the columns. You know, might have that reverse. But, but yeah, the off diagonal tells you uh, some things about how you're performing. Um, so how you're performing when it's actually a five and, and you incorrectly predicted. So these are the incorrect predictions on a binary classification. So um, when it was actually a false and I predict true, or when it was actually true and I predict false. Again, I hopefully. I uh, um, might have that reversed here. I'm, I'm sure it talks about it in the textbook. So, um, in fact, uh, I, I mean, you know, I, I always don't have this stuff memorized, but um, um, uh, yeah, I think the confusion matrix for a binary should look like that. Um, this, this is a figure from the textbook. Um, so yeah, I mean, your true negatives are going to be up here. And true positives would be down here for a binary uh, classification. Um, so, so this one would be your false negatives down here, that number. So that's the places where, um, um, yeah, it, it was actually a five, but I predicted it wasn't five. False negative. I, I, was, I falsely gave a, a not a five. And up here are false positives. So, um, and um, it was actually uh, should have been a negative, but I predicted it was a five, but it wasn't actually. So I said I incorrectly said it was positive. I incorrectly said it was um, a five. Uh, it's easy to you know uh, to not remember that, get that confused and things. Um, and then um, yeah, so um, uh, at this point, you know, we can talk about precision and recall, but uh, this is a good place to stop. So we're about out of time anyway. Um, so um, yeah, so that's it for today. Um, I'll leave you with that. We'll finish this stuff up um, um, on Thursday and hopefully we'll begin talking in earnest about the second uh, assignment for the class. All right, yeah, I got office hours as usual. I guess you could, actually, I might not be in my office hours for very long. So if you do need something, maybe come and walk with me if you can. All right. We'll see you guys on Thursday then. What's that? That question?